Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Zoom Into Wine. It's time for the show and your host, Ian Blackburn. Hello, hello. Good hello. evening, everybody. Thank you for Hi. Uh, John and I. How are you doing, buddy? Doing great, thank you. Just opening up another bottle here. <laughs> Always fun. Always fun. Well, uh, for those of you that have never met uh, John Baccio, good friend of mine, we've worked in the wine industry in different circles for many years, but uh, good uh, wine always brings us back together. That's right. And uh, John is uh, working with a company that imports a couple of the wines that we're tasting tonight. Um, I always love to up my game on champagne, John. Um, I would do a lot of champagne events. In fact, we're scheduling one right now. Terry Kamali, you and your friends may be excited to know that we're going to be doing a live champagne event, but it is a little different. We're going to do uh, our champagne challenge, but with dinner live in Los Angeles at Marino Restaurant on November 11th. Uh, we had a really good time the last time we did a dinner at Marino. We had a really good time the last time we did a champagne tasting. And uh, so we're going to pull them both together. If you don't know, Sal Marino is actually like the king of crudo in Los Angeles. So he's going to have a lot of fun with uh, a, a very seafood or uh, you could even do a vegetarian. Um, I'm entering into my vegetarian phase of the year. And so... Um, I will be hitting Marino a lot. He is the king of the farmer's market and uh, really an awesome place to go and a great value. Uh, does a really, really nice job. So tonight we're going to talk a little bit of champagne, get caught up on what's going on. It's a little crazy out there in the, in the champagne world right now. Uh, the market's um, thirsty and uh, you know the supply chain issues are real. Um, there are literally most of the main wines that you want to find at the store may be out of stock right now. Um, and I don't see uh, the wines coming in. They're not announcing them anyway. And if they come in, they get hoarded really quickly. And uh, it's really an interesting dynamic that we have. Kind of a short squeeze on champagne. But what's really cool is that it gives us a chance to maybe visit with some alternative brands and spread the love. Um, and that's kind of what I uh, had envisioned when we started putting this, this little uh, calendar together that we, we call Zoom Into Wine. Every Wednesday, a different Zoom and different things going on. And so uh, I thought, I, said, I asked John, I said, John, how about we talk about some champagne? Because this is a great moment to make people aware of some alternative brands. And uh, so let's go for it. How, what do you think? Where did Sounds go good to me. Yeah, excellent. Um, so hello everybody. Um, if, if, if you don't know me, um, I'm John as, as, as Ian mentioned. Uh, and I, um, it's 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 been a, a very challenging time to be a, a, a to to be importing a wine uh, for for quite some time, but um, one of the things that's really interesting I think um, goes back to um, long before the current issues at the port, and they start actually with the tariff that we that we had in in uh, 2020. So if you remember, we went into the uh, the pandemic. Uh, before the pandemic, there was a, a great big tariff put onto wine. Um, now, it wasn't on champagne, which was very interesting, um, but uh, it was on uh, lots and lots of other wines and various products from Europe. You you may all be familiar with this, so I apologize if I'm if I'm rehashing old John, history. Yeah. Didn't it start off as like an alcohol percentage thing? It had to have over. It was it was an alcohol percentage thing, but it, it affected all kinds of things. It affected you know uh, Italian cheese and Irish butter and and uh, French cheese and all kinds of different things. Uh, but uh, there was there was there was an alcohol threshold. Um, but uh, interestingly, um, uh, champagne wasn't wasn't initially part of it but because of all that there were there were um, many importers 
um, uh, uh, were reluctant to bring uh, wines of a certain price point into the United States. There was also a threat, so that tariff was you know, it was in the 25% range. There was a threat for the entire year that there was going to be a 100% tariff and that champagne was going to be added to that list. So um, the 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 100% tariff mercifully never never happened. Uh, but um, but basically, uh, throughout much of 2020, um, many importers were, were very, very worried because there are very few wines in the world that could survive a hundred percent tariff. And what happened was the tariff was even the 25% tariff was, was announced at, at, um, while there was obviously, while there were, 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 you know, boats on the water with, with wine. So, um, so things arrived into the United States. All of a sudden, you know, um, the the reorders of things were were much more expensive uh, when they hit the shore because of the 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 tariff structure. Coupled with that, the dollar plummeted. So um, so there were there were some wines that were um, just overnight fifty percent more expensive than they than than they were when they were ordered. So it was really a wild thing. So what happened was during the pandemic, a lot of importers actually slowed down the wines that were coming to the United States. So they, the 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 volume of wines and they and they started importing different things, lesser uh, you know less expensive wines, because they were worried that the 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 high end wines you know no one would pay. I don't know double price. Um, I mean, they were they were worried enough to pay half again as much, but then double the price. There was very few wines that could survive that. So there, there was all kinds of interesting stuff happening. And then uh, now we we fast forward. Even though the 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 tariffs were again, I'll use that word mercifully uh, repealed uh, 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 at the beginning of twenty uh, beginning of, of of this year. Uh, the um, the the uh, supply chain then was was all kind of backed up. So there were all kinds of things that were happening, and now we're we're sort of seeing that and dealing with those issues uh, uh, today. So uh, there there are many reasons why the um, the uh, the supply is 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 short for champagne, uh, actually all around the world. What's interesting is that is that some some importers like uh, my our company and and a few others kind of hedged this all along and worked with the, the growers and we were able to do this because we we um, worked with um, uh, smaller growers who put more of their uh, energy into into uh, uh, you know growing grapes and making wine than they do in into marketing budgets the 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 kind of big secret in the wine business sort of a that, that if you if you think about it a little bit um it, it, most of the big houses are 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 owned by these massive luxury brands uh -huh. um, and those massive luxury brands spend an awful lot of money on marketing um and if there are no events to market on sort of a global scale, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, big Formula One races and 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 giant sporting events and other things, then um, then then they get worried and they get nervous about putting a lot of, of supply out there um, without their their typical marketing plans. Um, the beauty of some of these smaller wines, like what we're going to be tasting tonight, is that they they don't rely as much on those kinds of uh, giant global events and sponsorships and things like that to uh, market their brands. It's 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 much more kind of word of mouth and and um, you know um, through people like Ian and and uh, educators uh, like Ian who who can who can help uh, spread the love that way. Uh, so um, consequently, we actually <laughs> are lucky because we have supply because uh most of the wine the, the 
the the wines that we're going to be tasting, for example, um, the, the, their tiny production. I mean, they make the, some of the big houses make more wine in a day than the entire combined output of both of the wineries that we're going to be tasting tonight um, for a year. So. Um, and even bigger than that. So uh, it, we're, we're, we're happy to have this kind of a challenge uh, on our end, because uh, we get, like uh, Ian mentioned, we get a chance to sort of uh, share our, you know, wonderful sort of under under the radar uh, wines with with people like you. So anyway, thanks very much for having me. And that's that's the kind of background that I look at uh, right now with the with the the, the champagne business. Um, and here we are. So and I'm, I'm I'm literally daily having conversations with almost every supplier about what is in stock, what's out of stock. Is that st in stock yet? You know, I've got uh, wines that I've ordered three weeks ago that were supposed to be in 10 days ago that aren't going to be in for 21 days. Do I order those or figure out something else to order? And it's really uh, uh, a different moment for the wine industry. I don't remember it being like this uh, ever. Um, I, I guess the only thing I can remember, John, is when I first started in selling wine, it was like the Merlot boom of the 1990s. And I had to call in. I was working for Young's Market Company. We had to call in to find out how many cases of Merlot we would be allowed to sell that day. That's how it worked. Wow. Um, wow. And I th I'm pretty sure that's the way champagne is right now. I mean, it's it's pretty crazy. And um, uh, you know, I, I, I usually think things that are, are working like this don't end very well. <laughs> I mean, it's usually a sign that something else is about to happen, but we'll we'll just have to see. So we're prepared. Yeah. We're prepared we, we, we do have to see. It's 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 a challenge. I, I mean, wines that uh, used to take um, between ten and twelve weeks from winery to um, to uh, uh, California, um, a winery in 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 France to California, uh, now are taking four to five months and sometimes longer. Uh, and uh, it's 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 a massive challenge. So you know when we when we couple all that with the sort of the I don't know the, the 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 challenge that we faced going into all this. There were there were so many um, you know so many spinning plates, so to speak. You know so many so many tiny little things that 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 were teetering that that uh, that looked like um, they 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 were uh, going to be a challenge, and they actually all almost all of those things have 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 come to pass, and the plates have started to fall. Uh, but uh, you know the the it's I, I read a story last week about uh, about some sort of Russian oligarch who uh, uh, you know sp spends time in the Hamptons uh, in New York who is who is you know concerned because he likes to have champagne with his breakfast uh, he likes to have you know very very famous uh, 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 champagne like Cristal with his breakfast and he was very he was very upset because he wasn't going to be able to do that um, and his his his, uh, his butler was only able to find ten dollar bottles of prosecco, um, and, uh, and they were trying to figure out how to <laughs> how to That's not make dubious, him mad. Dubious article from the beginning. But the uh, the fact <laughs> is that uh, right now um, that's another topic uh, that we should just throw out there is that about three months ago there were there was a lot of discussion about how in Russia uh, they were not going to allow the producers to call the wine champagne anymore. Uh, they they claimed that uh, in Russia they had made champagne first or something like that. Uh, I don't speak Russian, so it's all translated to me. But um, that uh, they were take they were going to require that champagne change then the name or something like that or um, call it sparkling wine and put it into Russia. So that finally passed. That like got we got past that. Let's just put it that way. So um, uh, apparently the champagne houses can again go back into Russia with their wines, but uh, maybe they shouldn't. Anyway, let's uh, let's let's talk about what we're gonna we're gonna drink tonight, John, because I am thirsty, and uh, I've had Me too. one of the busiest couple of weeks uh, of my my life i think i mean we really uh, some crazy things are happening we've got a lot of different projects and uh, it's it's time to drink some champagne john so let's uh let's get some 
let's get some bubbles open and get a glass going on. We got uh, the rest of the, the group is getting their wines ready to go too. And uh, I'd love for you guys to open one or both. And um, uh, let's, let's go into the slideshow and just learn a little bit about it, but let's get some wine in the glass and be able to do that. Thanks for having me, by the way, everyone. Yeah. Cheers to all of you. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. I'm so glad that you could do this with us because um, John uh, has quite a quite a past. He worked up in San Francisco at the Ferry Building and um, worked for Robert Mondavi. He was in a in a very famous wine movie, uh, <laughs> kind of a crazy wine movie, and. Um, um, and, and John has taught uh, a lot of programs with us that learn about wine. And, and whenever I come back, the, all the students are a little depressed. They have to listen to me again because John's so uh, so great at what he does. So um, we have we have a really fun little uh, PowerPoint to kind of get us up to speed. John, do you want to talk anything about on our our slide here about our map of Champagne? Sure. I'm, I'm just just to to give you an idea. Uh, so Champagne, you can see on the on the 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 map um, the the map of France. It's very far north, and because it's so far north, uh, you know, just just a, a few kind of background things about about uh, Champagne. Um, you know, uh, the the. the you know, you may or may not know. Um, uh, first, um, uh, it's it's a uh, obviously it's 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 named for the region, and that that sort of purple section there is the is the is the Champagne region. The um, there's quite a bit of of of, uh, uh, of evidence that that points to the idea that that for a long time. Um, the, the 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 bubbles were sort of considered a flaw and um probably what happened was uh, they would make a make the wine they made a, a a primary wine so the 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 still wine like we we drink lots of uh, i'm sure on this call so you know um they they harvest the grapes and they somehow get the juice out and the the yeast eats the sugar and when yeast eats sugar you get alcohol but you also get carbon dioxide um, but in this case, uh, the, the, the cool winter season would, uh, probably, uh, came along and they, they, they put the wine, uh, away to, they thought it was, it was, uh, it was done. This was before they even understood what, what yeast was. Uh, and in the, in the, 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 the fermentation was probably not finished. Yeast will stop eating sugar if it gets uh, too cool. So um, there are two things that stop yeast from eating sugar. One of them is is uh, uh, alcohol. That's one of the reasons why um, certain wines, they actually stop fermentation by adding a little bit of alcohol like they do with something like port. Um, or or um, uh, the, the temperature gets cold enough. Now, if the temperature gets cold enough, the yeast basically falls asleep. Uh, sort of like people, we, we, we fall asleep when it gets uh, too cold. That's the first thing that happens. Anyway, um, the, the, in the springtime, the yeast probably woke up and uh, the bubbles came along. So the, 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 the fermentation wasn't finished all the way. The yeast woke up, found out there was still some sugar and started eating the, the, the sugar again. Um, this was such a problem that uh, that in fact uh, uh, many of the the writings of very famous uh, uh, monk called Dom Perignon, um, one many of his earliest uh, uh, writings were about uh, trying to figure out what was going wrong with the the uh, the the wine that was in the bottle. In fact, the, the, they, they, they couldn't figure it out at all uh, because again, they didn't know yet about uh, yeast. Um, Louis Pasteur was the person who figured out uh, uh, what was going on with, with, with yeast. So uh, that's many, many years uh, uh, later, obviously. Anyway, um, eventually, Dom Perignon was he was uh, one of the things he was great at was was marketing. And uh, he figured out that maybe the way to do this, uh, the best way to do things was to just sort of like convince everybody that the bubbles are wonderful. So he started talking about the bubbles as being, uh, you know, uh, like angels, you know, 
dancing and all of these wonderful uh, poetic sort of sorts of terms. And uh, now we have the, the, the bubbles that exist. Now, of course, what happens is they make a still wine. So they make a wine where the primary fermentation happens and they put the wine into a wine bottle like this one. And, um, and then they add a little bit more yeast and a little bit more sugar. And um, through a, um, a second fermentation that happens in the bottle, the bubbles are, are developed and integrated into the, into the bottle. And I'm sure many of you know that, so I won't go too deep into the, the technical aspects of it. Um, but um, what, what happens next though is important because eventually the bottle will uh, uh, they'll, they'll actually twist the bottle all the way upside down and then they'll freeze the neck of the bottle um, and they'll, they'll, they'll turn it up and they'll, they'll open up the bottle and um, take the, the yeast cells out. And then the bottle has, it's, it's not all the way full, so they have to actually top it up. This gets to the geographic area as well because most champagnes are are not non-vintage champagnes they're non-vintage because it's so far north in france that the weather is pretty crappy in in champagne and because of that they can't always get a predictably fabulous harvest so for many many years they've blended wines from multiple vintages or multiple harvests um, to uh, to uh, 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 complete the 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 bottle uh, to fill up the bottle. Now uh, uh, they do this even in a in a uh, it, it's a little trickier when they have to do it for what, when they declare a vintage. In other words, there's only one year in the bottle. But most of them are uh, they're they're noted as NV or non vintage, and that again is because the the um, the they they need to use wine from the previous year or in some cases like the day or that we're going to have from many previous years um, uh, to make the wine. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But all of the regions that you see highlighted in that sub in that area are all very, very small locations that each boast different types of uh, microclimates and also soil types. Uh, and that's going to obviously influence the, the character of the wine. So not only do we have multiple grapes that are grown in the Champagne region, but we also have different soil types and uh, and different climates that can affect what's growing up above ground. Speaking so. of uh, supply chain, just got a delivery, 7.30 at night. Never happened before. Amazing. <laughs> and I, my store hours end at four o'clock, so, uh, that's, and they know that. So they're, they're still trying to make the delivery and he's got four more deliveries to try to make. So, <clears throat> wow. Crazy. That is crazy. Well, let's talk about uh, Diebolt because I think you've been giving them a great foundation about uh, the history of wine. But um, I've uh, really enjoyed this particular producer for a long time and is a, a champagne from the Cremant uh, part of, of the Champagne region, which on the map here, where's Cremont? Do you know? Yeah. So it's, it's to the, it's that, there, right? that in that Côte de Blanc area, that, that dark green area. Yeah. Right there, right there. Yeah. So, um, and that's really the future of, of Champagne is getting very site specific. Um, and you're going to see that more and more on, on different labels and maybe even vineyard designations starting to become a little bit more uh, prevalent. There's already a number of very famous vineyards that are celebrated, but uh, the, the number may intensify here as the Champagne Wars begin. Yeah, so Cremant uh, um, in the Côte de Blanc is, is particularly, it's got, there's a lot of chalk in the soil. It's particularly suited for, um, for very, very elegant uh, Chardonnay. So we think, you know, in because we we often think of California Chardonnay, they can they can be big, powerful, rich wines um, because of our soils and our weather um, and our climate. Uh, but in Champagne, in the Champagne region, as, as a contrast, 
uh, the Chardonnay is almost always the, the 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 most delicate, rather than the 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 biggest richest wine. It's it it, it can often be the most delicate in the blend, um, and especially in this region where they have a lot of chalk in the soil, and in in and that's that that is what it brings up. In fact, if you if you ever uh, it, it, uh, you know from a geologic standpoint. Uh, Champagne, the same kind of soil. Uh, what, you know, once upon a time, England was 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 up against uh, 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 France when the you know before the tectonic plates moved it away. Uh, and um, if you ever see pictures of the kind of white cliffs of Dover, there are a lot of theories that that put that right up against this 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 region um, in 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 France because they share uh, soil types. So that that sort of white, fa very famous white soil that you see on those cliffs um, in in of, of pictures in England, uh, that's 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 not very different than what we see in in these uh, in 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 this this part of uh, uh, France. So, and that's why we're seeing uh, the sparkling wine industry take off in England. Uh, well, soils were always there, but the weather has warmed up to a point where now the English can grow, and uh, also we've. Um, kind of learn how to grow a particular type of clone that the English can grow without the powdery white mildew, which has been their issue. And so now uh, there's full on sparkling wine production in England and the biggest investor in that are the Champenois. They are uh, they're going in and trying to buy more land because there just isn't more land to buy up in the Champagne region. And, and if, it, if there is something to buy, it's really expensive. So England is kind of the new uh, frontier. Um, this brand, how long have you been representing uh, Diebel? Uh, it's been about, I, it's two or three three years maybe. They, they, they've they been around for a long time though in the United States market, maybe, maybe four years. Um, but uh, we, we, we started working with them a few years ago, but you have a long history with them, right? Ian, you've been working yeah, with I them mean, for we, a while. It, yeah. This was always on, a, on a number of restaurant wine lists and I'm not sure who, if a wine wise always had the brand, uh, no, it was Mar it was Martins before. Martins, okay. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, and uh, that's a, a very reputable importer as well. <clears throat> and this wine was always in the wine program. Uh, and so when I taste it, there's something very familiar about it. It's got a, a unique uh, uh, presentation. It's uh, really just kind of a, a house favorite, and. Uh, the the I'm, I'm kind of surprised to see how much Meunier is in this wine. I didn't realize there was uh, uh, 20 to 30 percent Meunier, but Chardonnay is the white grape, and then the two Pinot varieties, Pinot Meunier and Pinot Noir. And um, uh, I just really get, I really think this wine, even though it has a strong Chardonnay presence, it's the Meunier and the and the Pinot Noir that I really smell. In this wine and there's like a very earth oriented notion in the nose it's not very fruity it's not um, dosed to a point where it's candied or anything like that it's wonderfully um, uh, balanced and pretty and stylish and uh, and, and, and really uh, gorgeous and I hope someone's drinking it is someone drinking it out there Terry Lisa Mary Satsuko, any of you got a little bit of the uh, Debo in your glass? Yeah, Mary's got some. How's it treating you, Mary? No, I ha I have the other one. Oh, you have the other the, one. The bottle was so pretty because I can't drink, you know, champ a bottle of champagne. So I, I I opened the other one because I figured the other one this was like looked a little bit more special. All right, and Terry, what? How about you guys? We're loving this one. Uh, you're right. I think. Uh, the blend of the Pinot Noir and the Meunier is uh, really outstanding on it. Mm. It's great. Yeah, I, I can I say also when you when you mentioned the, the 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 dose or the dosage, so that's the bit. That's how the house comes up with their sort of house style, and um, in in champagne terms, there are lots of um, that there there are. 
let's see, there there are ranges for each uh, amount that 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 they can add. So brut, which is what what uh, uh, many wines are that you've had that that's actually a um, a uh, designation of 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 basically how much residual sugar is 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 in it and um like i said there's kind of a range that exists uh but even they within that um, they sorry put, they put brood on the label twice on this picture yeah so it's it, I mean, <laughs> they they, they kind of want you to know uh brute um but that that's the, it for for the most part there there's there's there should be in a brute champagnes these days um the, there's there's very little perceptible sweetness in those um the the big houses kind of cheat a little bit because they 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 can some of them are famous for um uh using the highest level of pers of, of of sugar that they can to still call it brute um and um and in you know the sort of more kind of cutting edge houses um tend to go on the leaner end of things and i think that's because uh even even though they might want to have some um uh some uh, uh you know, some of the sugar actually gives a little bit of pleasure on the on to the senses, but uh, we 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 don't want to obscure the 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 character of the soil. Uh -huh. um, and uh, sometimes, if there's too much sugar in the dosage, uh, you know, people who drink a lot of wine and a lot of champagne, like. Ian and I uh, will tell you that 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 sometimes um, can obscure a little bit of those that the, the sort of terroir or the the character of the soil and the and the weather that existed. Uh, but because it's a blend, there's always going to be something that comes up with a house style. So that's what that's why sometimes houses use words like uh, tradition or tradition uh, um, on their on their their house cuvées. So. And I, um, also uh, something that's pretty in vogue right now with champagne houses is on the back label. Uh, they talk about this wine going into Tirage in 2017 and disgorged uh, September 20th uh, or September two, two, 2020, which obviously shows you about three years of bottle um, aging. Um, and that, uh, that type of date disclosure activity didn't occur 10, 15 years ago, maybe some houses, but uh, it, there are a lot of houses starting to talk about that. They want to kind of separate themselves because there's a lot of, uh, you know, the very inexpensive champagnes that maybe you go to Costco and you see Costco champagne. Um, they're going to make that less expensive by lessening the time. And the, to the minimum time requirement, what is, I think it's 15 months, 18 months, uh, I can't recall um for champagne um uh, and and they're gonna nail that 15 to 18 month period and because time is money and they're gonna get that moving towards their store so um you know they're they're probably not going to be the one uh champagne house that's going to talk about how long it's been aged in the cellar and i doubt that veuve clicquot will disclose that information either there's just there's the logistics of that it's just nightmarish they have to keep their supply moving through um, but the better houses, smaller houses, uh, more luxury oriented brands, they're going to be celebrating the, this information and really differentiating themselves by, uh, you know, just, you know, if it's vintage dated, you know, look at, uh, Dom, Cristal, their current vintages are 10 years old. And so they're telling you right there on the label, uh, we, we really take a long time to release this, this wine. Uh, so the Debo is uh, 2017 um, when it was put in the bottle. It doesn't necessarily talk about what is in the cuvee here, John, but do you know of any of their, their blending practices, uh, reserve wines? Uh, what are they using alternating vintages? So 17, 15, maybe some. Yeah, they, they, they do. Um, I, I actually have no, hang on. Let me see. I might have that in my notes on, on this. Let me, let me see. I have that in my notes on the, on the do or um, the, the, we insist with all of our um, producers um, that they do that, that um, uh, give you as much information as possible on the back because we 
see it as a badge of honor, as as Ian mentioned. Um, and I, I will I will tell you that um, that this one has uh, 2015, 2014, and 2013 blended into it. So uh, this is this is wine from three different vintages that goes back to 2013. Uh, so, uh, it's, it's really the whole, the whole thing about champagne. If you ever get a chance to go there, they always talk about blending, uh, blending is, is a, is a, is a, you know, such a, such an art there and the, 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 uh, just how much of each proportion goes into it is, 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 is very, very important. Uh, now they, they have lots of different, um, uh, you know, even a producer like this has has different bottlings, and uh, 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 you know how how all those different bottlings uh, come about, and 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 where they where they are in terms of um, the 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 amount of each one of the different cuvées that go into it. It makes a huge difference. I brought a uh, a bottle just for fun. Uh, um, of one of their other wines that actually carries on the label, um, the uh, I don't know if you can see this picture, but the 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 image that Ian has on the on the um, on the Zoom from or on the presentation from a couple of uh, slides ago is is their sort of house label um, that 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 image. So you know they each they each have a different um a, 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 you know different bottlings um these the so beyond beyond just having their sort of house style they also sort of drill down even further based on uh vintage and um and 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 blend so huh. anyway oh another thing that you should know um note uh, which was uh, something to follow up on something that Ian said a minute ago uh when he mentioned that the the cuvee, the different amounts that are in each cuvee of the of the the different grapes, uh, in if you ever see a wine that that says uh, blanc de blanc, white of white in in Champagne, which is which you might see in, especially from this region that uh, that De Beauvoir is in in Cremant. Um, that's what that means is white of white, which means that it all came from Chardonnay. So it would still be a blend of some sort, but in that case, they would use Chardonnays from different parcels from within the vineyard. So this picture that Ian's got up right now is excellent because you can sort of see, you, you see one one slope of the vineyard, you, you, you see how they're sort of divided up. This is obviously up on, on, on one slope, but you could imagine that this, this tiny little sort of sub valley almost, you know, one is going down, the other one's coming up. You know, the, the sun is gonna hit each one of those different, uh, the, those, those different sections of the vineyard in a slightly different way. The drainage is gonna happen in a slightly different way. So each one of these, these houses will have many, many, many different uh, uh, different parcels of land that they that they harvest and they choose from. So even though it it's 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 a uh, it's a, a blend in the vineyard that happens first, then they layer that on top of that. They blend this idea of from one year to the next, and sometimes uh, from multiple years, which is what we've got in this in this in this glass. So and another thing I like to point out is that uh, you know these guys have vine density uh, requirements they can't water their vines everything's got to be done by hand this is a big differentiating factor between champagne and say prosecco or cava or other uh, sparklings of the world champagne has really high standards they will not let producers make bad wine so they they measure you know maximum yields how much fruit you can get from a vineyard they max you out, and if you go over, you get punished. Uh, they don't want large yields. They don't want uh, low quality, and so uh, even though these vines are tightly spaced uh, together, that doesn't mean they're going to make a lot of wine. They're actually really competing for sunlight, for um, and they're going to th these vines are going to be forced to focus on quality. I think also it's important to note uh, back to something else you mentioned, Ian, about uh, I hope I'm not being too discursive and talking too much. It's already 20 minutes. Uh, anyway, um, there's the, the 
you can cut me off, but <laughs> it's 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 important to uh, note uh, that you know, regardless of what they say in Russia, um, the the French are very very protective of that word champagne. It is a place. And we often like to nickname any sparkling wine champagne. And I'm sure you've heard this before, um, but I, I always tell people whenever we're tasting at an, almost any level of champagne tasting, it's not a uh, kind of a, a, an arrogant French thing that they're getting at. It's really a, um, they, they, they have such heritage in this, in this place. Uh, and um, uh, this, this goes back, you know, many, many generations. And they've protected the, the, this heritage, not just through the modern means that, that Ian has mentioned with things like, you know, testing the yields and, and making sure that they, they farm correctly and, and all of these things out in the vineyards. But even kind of anecdotally uh, um, and historically, uh, you know, uh, one of the, the most amazing stories about uh, wine history is that, that uh, you know, uh, Hitler knew that 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 champagne was a, a, a special thing. And uh, uh, his, they, they, they went after the, the stocks of champagne. Uh, they, they, they stole them, they broke them, they smashed them, they, they, they hoarded the very best. And if you ever have a chance to go to the Champagne region, I don't know if any, any of you have, but they will gladly show you um, cellars where they, they squirreled away stocks of champagne so that the Nazis would not find them uh, because this was their, 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 their family's work, their, their, the, 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 all of their, their, their passion and toil that they had put uh, into um, many generations in, in the vineyards. Uh, and uh, they, they, you know, they sort of sealed up these caves and all of these things uh, un underneath uh, the the towns, the small towns that are there. Uh, we 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 forget some of those details. People were were willing to uh, almost die for this. So when they when they when they they say that they don't like people around the rest of the world calling whatever sparkling wine they bought at 7-Eleven champagne. Um, there, there, there are many, many reasons for that. Uh, and uh, it's an important thing. I mean, you, you look at this slide here, the, so uh, Dibo, it's called Dibo Valois because it's two families. So the Dibo family and the Valois, um, they, they, they came together um, through marriage. Um, but you can see that the Valois family had been, uh, you know, growing grapes since the 15th century. Uh, this was, uh, uh, I mean, th these 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 families have tremendous heritage in these in these regions. And they're very very proud of them. Um, now, something that's very interesting that we you know we you, you may have sort of you know cottoned on to is that when we talk about these small houses, really there are lots and lots of small growers in Champagne. And most of the big houses just buy buy grapes because they couldn't possibly supply the 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 world supply on the sort of high end. Um, but it's quite expensive to make your own wine, so it's one of the reasons why uh, uh, Champagne um, was for many many years the the champagnes that people knew about were on the sort of the 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 I don't know the 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 big the big houses were the only things that we ever heard of. But some of these small houses of sort of toiled away and in the last few generations they've started to make wines on their own and so that's what we have uh, uh here tonight some people call them grower champagnes some people they, they they have all kinds of things if you look very very carefully on the labels on any one of these labels there are there are usually uh, a couple of uh of um uh, initials that you'll see on the label um and uh you might see um uh, uh the the labels nm is the is the one that you see in the in in most of them and and uh d boulevard was an nm which means that they they uh both make their own wine and they buy some grapes as well uh so that stands for negotiant manipulant uh then we have uh rm which which is it it, it just means uh that they're they 
only make wine from their own vineyards that they own. So th there, there are others as well. I won't bore you with them. I think there are seven that I can think of, uh, but, uh, um, but those are the two big ones that we see. The big houses are all NM, meaning that they buy grapes. And that's simply a matter of, of economics. They just certainly couldn't supply the world with enough, uh, enough wine to, m m to own their own vineyards for all of it. So. Right. And some of them, some of them do own a lot of vineyards, but they just can't, they don't want to have to change the label each time and, and control expectations. So they um, go to negotiate because sometimes they will need to buy, or maybe they always buy, but they use their own vineyards plus the fruit that they buy. Um, beautiful, beautiful uh, estate here. And uh, I've been, I was flipping through some, some, some shots here that the couple um you know there's a lot of uh amazing stories in champagne too about the women of champagne and how often the the man uh male you know was the heir of the property but um then the they get married and then the husband would die and it was the woman the vuv the widow that would take over the property uh, she looks like she's like checking him out. Is is he okay? Is he still alive? <laughs> yeah, he is. He's 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 quite old now. Uh, and in fact, the estate is now run by their two children. Um, the 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 son does a lot of the work in the vineyards and um, and a lot of the work uh, outside of the winery. Uh, and Isabel. Uh, the daughter uh, is actually the winemaker. So this wine is made by um, Isabel de Bolvawa, and she runs the show. But this is this is the old man, uh, uh, and uh, you know, going over and and you see, uh, it's a it's a it's a, a barrel that he's tasting from using the thief there. That's another thing that's very it's 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 important to note. Uh, you know, some of the smaller houses like these. Um, they might do a primary fermentation in stainless steel or maybe concrete or even uh, a wooden cask, uh, but they age their wines often in small barrels like this before the wines go into uh, into bottle for the secondary, the, 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 the fizzy fermentation, let's call it, the, the one that gets the bubbles going. Uh, so that's the case here. And it, uh, you know, this, this whole, I mean, bottling technology, this is a very old region. I mean, we, we couldn't have had, uh, uh, you know, long ago, uh, when wine was shipped around the world, wine was shipped to the, 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 the big, um, uh, businessmen in, in, in London, even many of the great wines from France were sent France and Portugal and Spain. They were all, uh, you know, they were often sent mostly France and, and, and Portugal. They were sent to England. That story is, is told a lot in Bordeaux, um, to be bottled. The British had the bottling technology. Uh, they they had the bottles. This was you know many 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 generations ago, uh, and in fact a, a champagne bottle when it's when it's done uh, méthode champenoise, which means uh, uh, champagne method or, or or traditional method. That's what we see now, traditionnel. Um, uh, that, that that's done in the bottle like this, uh, and and the the bottle is is quite a bit heavier than it is uh, on a regular wine bottle. Uh, and that's so that it can hold the pressure. I often tell people I, I, I you know, I go through, I, I've seen a lot of people, even very wine knowledgeable people and servers and restaurants and things hurt themselves very, very uh, uh, badly opening up a bottle of champagne. Um, the, 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 the cork itself, it's, it's held on by this, this, this wire cage, it's called a musile. Every one of these, everywhere around the world, always has six turns in it. It's for it's for safety's sake. So there are always. So I, I always tell people never take the cage off. You see people do this all the time. They take this outside cage off and they put the bottle down on the table um, while they're gathering their thoughts or doing whatever. If the cage is no longer on there, the musile. Uh, it's 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 one one more uh, uh, it's it, it becomes a little bit more dangerous, um, and uh, and it, and the, the cork can pop right out. So you you never want to take your hand off. So you always twist one two three four five six, and then and then just sort of loosen it like that, and then just twist the bottle out. It'll always come out, or you know most of the time it'll it'll come off pretty easily. Um, but the bottle technology is amazing. I mean it, it, we don't think about it, but. 
uh, I mean, there's there's between three and four times the amount of pressure in the average champagne bottle than what's in a car tire. Uh, so it's it's quite a bit of pressure that's in there. So um, so you, you always want to uh, be careful with that. Keep them nice and cold so they don't they don't hurt you. So anyway. Yeah, cool. Well, we uh, we hope that you enjoyed the Debo, um, and it is. Uh, um, I, I did not know about the two family um, coming together, and it was that was fairly recent uh, that that happened, right? Uh, yeah, um, they 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 established as a, as a family. They they've been yeah exactly the the marriage they established them. They, they've been dating for a while, those two, and they established that and 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 came together. They'd always been uh, families that worked together, um, and then the, then eventually they 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 came together. I think in the in the the sixties um, and the seventies, the 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 combination started the De Beauvalois. Um, uh, that's 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 when they they began. So very cool. Well, that'll remain a standard on the merchant line, um, and it's at a very good price point. Uh, maybe, maybe you might argue it's uh, maybe a too a little too low because uh, you know you see bigger brands with a higher price, uh, but these guys are are really fighting for their for their market share. They want to get out there and they want to get tasted, and this is one of the best values we have on the, on the website. Um, it's around forty dollars a bottle, and uh, there's not a lot of champagnes that are fighting at that price point anymore. Um, and so I, I, I maintain that it's one of the better opportunities that we have. Um, John, we are also going to show off another wine tonight, and uh, this is going to be my first time tasting it tonight. This is the D Hors, and this yeah. came from from your recommendation, and I'm already uh, appreciative that uh, you told me to buy it. So this is a, a house that's very focused on Meunier, yeah? Yeah, they're very focused on Meunier. Uh, they, they come from uh, the Marne Valley um, and uh, from a, a region that is uh, is is known for uh, for Meunier. So there there are quite a few grapes uh, permitted in in the Champagne region. I think there are six. I think, um, and we have one house that bought, that that uses all of them. Um, but uh, you know, the big houses almost never talk about uh, Meunier. Uh, Meunier, it, it, and, and it's too bad. There's, it's, it's, it's fantastic. It's, uh, I, I, I love it. Uh, it adds texture and, and, and uh, weight. The other thing is they're going to start talking about it because uh, Meunier is a, a um, you, you might see it, you, by the way, you might see it called Meunier or Pinot Meunier. It, it is actually a relative of the Pinot Noir grape, um, but it's, a, it's an early ripening grape. Uh, and because it's an early ripening grape in in this climate, uh, it's an early ripening grape. Uh, they uh, uh, it, it because of that, it's actually very well suited for climate change, because uh, uh, Champagne's getting warmer. The region is getting warmer, as Ian said. It's now warm enough right up in England to reliably ripen black grapes uh, for the first time in ever. Um, but uh, uh, anyway, Meunier is interesting. It means um, that that word Meunier, M-E-U-N-I-E-R. It means the miller, so like the flower miller. So that's because the 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 grape itself, the 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 vines, uh, the, the 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 leaves on the underside of the leaves, they have this funny kind of uh, powdery sort of look to them. And so the idea is that the the word comes from the miller. You could imagine, or one could imagine, a person who mills flour all day long. Uh, having flour all over them, um, that's what the name comes from. So it, 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 it's, it, you know, that sort of powdery look when you see, or when, if, if you've ever seen somebody milling flour uh, all over their clothes and everything else, uh, that's, that's where the, the name comes from. Now, um, these are both uh, what, what, what we call uh, sustainably grown because uh, they're not uh, certified organic or anything. But in the case of Deor, um, they, they, they are, you know, incredibly meticulous with everything that happens uh, in the vineyard and everywhere else. Um, this estate was uh, established 
in the 1930s by the current winemaker's grandfather. Uh, so the current winemaker is a, a man called Jérôme, Jérôme uh, Deor. Uh, and uh, he is uh, uh, meticulous with just about everything that he does. Uh, uh, he, they, they've really never used any kind of, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, pesticide or herbicide. Now, this is this is incredibly difficult to do in the entire Champagne region, but especially where they are, because they're actually close to, um, they're, they're not far from a, a, a river, and they get uh, quite a bit of um, uh, humidity off of the, the the river. So even though it's quite cool there, they still get some some humid conditions, um, and that humidity is uh can really threaten the vines with uh with different kinds of molds and mildews uh that actually ian mentioned earlier being a challenge uh it takes an awful lot of work to to uh to um to uh fight these things off uh and uh what they do with their fermentation is that most of the primary fermentation here happens in stainless steel, although some happens in concrete and, and also in oak. But then he does a lot of uh, 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 oak aging uh, as well. Um, neither one of these houses does any fining or filtering. This one, this one uh, doesn't uh, as well, and they sort of wear that as a as a badge of honor. Um, I I can see on the this particular thing that we've got the the uh, uh, when the dosage was done, when it was disgorged and put in the bottle. This says and you see that it says six grams. What that means is grams per liter of of uh, sugar in the the dosage. That's pretty low for a brute, uh, brute, uh, it, it, but it, it, it depends on the grape variety um, uh, and again, the house style. Now, Jérôme um, has a, uh, uh, a, what he calls a, a solera. Um, it's a, it's a, a term that we sometimes see used in, in, in uh, Spain for, uh, uh, making wines there, where they actually blend wines from from uh, uh, many years. Jerome's reserve wine for this bottling, uh, he 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 takes a significant portion of a reserve wine that has been going since 1998. So what that means is they'll take a little bit out. Uh, uh, of their their Solera, and then they'll top it up with each new subsequent vintage. Um, this particular Solera that goes into this one goes back to 1998, uh, and uh, that's pretty remarkable. That's that's a lot of work that's being put into a wine like this to sort of accentuate the quality and um, and you know. The idea of, of 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 sort of blending comes into a, a whole new type of a level when we're talking about someone who's who's not just taking wines from uh, a, a few different uh, vintages. This one is based on the 2016 vintage. It's already quite old, uh, and then it's it's being supplanted by wines that have been blended since 1998. So there's quite a bit of of, of work that goes into into uh, making a wine like this. This is very seductive, I think. This particular one. Um, well, I'm going to play this video real quick. Oh, cool. We don't have the volume on. We could also talk over it. Is it just music underneath? Yeah, it's just music. But okay. that flipping that they're doing sort of evokes the idea of 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 um, riddling the bottle. When they, when, as I told you before, when they when they're making a wine, they will they will twist the bottle like this, mm. and they twist the bottle to allow for that's what he's doing there to allow for the 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 the, the yeast um, cells to sort of go thoroughly through the, the, the champagne. There he is, by the way, that's the, that's, uh, Jerome. Pretty good, pretty interesting guy. He, now he uses, uh, it, it's interesting. Um, he uses, uh, wild, uh, yeast for his fermentations here. Um, and, uh, that's a very tricky thing. Most, most, uh, most producers in champagne use a, a very neutral yeast. That's very predictable. 
there are only a handful who uh, rely on the wild yeasts. Now, uh, Jerome, um, he doesn't just use what's sort of going on all over the place. It's actually uh, worked in his in that cellar there. They they isolated all the yeast that 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 show up every year uh, that 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 are living in the in the uh, cellars here, and they uh, they've propagated the one that they like the most, uh, which is really interesting. So it's a it's a it's a it's a wild yeast that that is growing, but they they it, in case it doesn't in case the one that 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 come comes in with the harvest each year in case it doesn't uh, work you know do its its magic or whatever they can add um their own yeast that they've isolated that that exist so their own wild yeast so it's not it's not based on sort of commercial yeast that you might uh get um you know at a winemaking you know supplier or whatever this the the, the yeast that's the, used to make talk about the color john um because it, yeah, it's, it's darker it's got yeah. a, it's got a, like it looks like you could you could see that they're uh, I mean, you may suspect that they're allowing things like natural fermentation, that they're using older wine, um, that they're willing to take some risks. There's definitely some advanced golden tones in the color that would suggest that they're not too worried about, you know, um, a little oxygen touching the wine. And uh, I, I wondered if there was even some skin contact or you know, uh, I, think, I think a little, I think a little bit, I don't know in my lights, not very good where I am. Um, but maybe you can see better Ian. you're in a better lit room. Um, I, it, does it get into the, it's, it's almost what I can see in my room is it's, it's, it's almost into that sort of on, onion skin sort of range. Um, that's a, you know, in the, in the, when you taste wine with, uh, nerdy wine people they try to come up with names of colors to things but that's that that one starts into into that into that zone you're absolutely right about that um the the complexity that comes from um you know the wild yeast um you know uh, also fermenting um you know giving some time and as you suggest that solera where they they allow, allow the wine to age for many many years what that does in a wine like this is it adds complexity um you know the 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 english um you know talk about um uh when when they taste wines like these they they start to talk about things like uh um uh biscuits uh biscuit aromas um and other things it's 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 not quite um yeasty in the way that you might think of like a bread yeast but uh smelling but it's not that far off of that either. There's 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 definitely some some kind of interesting kind of earthiness going on. Um, I just think it's wonderful. There's also a, I I smell a lot of kind of uh, uh, dried uh, 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 almost like dried herb sort of uh, thing going on in this in this wine. It's pretty I'm cool. Kind of like a gingerbread kind of a yeah. character too. Really. Yeah, like spice. Yeah. Yeah, gingerbread spice and spices and stuff, and it's it's really got some beautiful character in the nose it's um, quite uh, developed um, and it really sets itself apart and I think it may it may be a little divisive for some people that like maybe are accustomed to something a little more I don't want to say fresh like that's the right way to, to be but this, this has got uh, almost a preserved nature to it like a little bit more of that uh, umami level type stuff that's happening because some of the freshness has been allowed to go away. And so now we can really get into that spice and that, you know, uh, maybe even some bruised fruits. And, yeah, it's savory. Uh, yeah. Yeah, quince yeah. taste and things like that. Yeah. It's cool. I, you know, both of these wines have really marked it, marked, marked, marked uh acidity too which allows them to, to both like really linger also jerome doesn't um he he doesn't uh, uh, uh wine like this it, it's it's not quite as fizzy as the other one i don't know if you notice the texture is it, it tends to be a little bit and that's that's by design as well um the 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 um attack, the attack uh, yeah exactly the yeah attack of the 
that mousse in your mouth is very um, vinous and very wine, you know, and that sounds kind of stupid. It's wine, obviously, but it's got a richness and a roundness and a softness where the bubble is discovered after a little time in the mouth. And it's, I, th I love this style. I love it. Love, love, love. In fact, I'm starting to love it a little too much, John. I've already had about two glasses. The bottle's half full. Good. Quite too you might as well. I mean, once you open it, you got you got to drink it. So yeah, I mean, um, you know, both both Jerome and um, and uh, Isabel uh, 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 de Beauvoir, they both talk about um, you know that they they say sort of, you know drink it in whatever kind of glass you want, but generally, um, and, and, and we, we love these flutes. They're, they're a lot of fun. Um, but they're, they're, they both happen to be proponents of, of just sort of using a white wine glass for their, for their, uh, their, uh, champagnes. So, but whatever, whatever you got is fine. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not arrogant about my glassware. Some people really, well, really the whole idea. It. The whole idea, John, is that the, you know, before those wines didn't necessarily have the greatest nose and, and, and we didn't make the best glasses either. And now the glassware has gotten so good and our grape growing is understanding of grape growing has improved. The wines are better. There's more detail to notice. So moving it out of the, the, the flute into a better wine glass is absolutely where the market has been trying to go slowly. They don't want to offend people because they know all, pretty much every American has a couple of champagne flutes in their house. But um, it, it's uh, it's absolutely part of the future is to have uh, a really great you know wine experience in a wine glass. And uh, this Very the cool. picture there was uh, uh, Jerome as well. Yep, yep, that's him. The the glasses there. Basket press. Look at that. And uh, do you, do you think they're doing a lot of the riddling by hand? They do. They do a combination of, of hand riddling and uh, and um, they don't use big uh, what what are called gyro palettes or gyro palettes. So if you ever go up to actually, you know, I have to say it's it's a great tour. If you if you have a chance, um, the 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 tour at if you go to Napa, the tour at Domain Shandon is fantastic. Um, it's 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 just a really good introduction. But there they will show you their giant gyro palettes, where the, which are these things that are like, you know, the size of uh, I don't know, I, I don't know how big they are. They're massive, twenty by twenty maybe. Um, uh, and and they're these enormous m machines. We'll pick them up and tilt them. The the it's it's very very expensive and uh, to to do hand riddling. Um, I think what he's doing here is he's probably checking the, the, the yeast to see how it's coming along, mm -hmm. but you can see how it's tilted away. If you ever see a, 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 uh, uh, um, if you ever go to a, a, a wine bar, or, I don't know, some winery and they, and they have something that's like that, a, it looks like an A-frame and it's got a bunch of tiny little, a uh, bunch of holes in it. That's what's, that's called a riddling rack. Um, riddling is the is the term that's used for um, for you know spinning the bottle to allow uh, the yeast to sort of do its job, and um, in fact the the person who's credited with inventing that I I don't know if she actually did but she gets credit for it is is the widow Clicquot of Clicquot, um, so I, who knows if she was actually in a stellar doing hand riddling but um maybe her her minions were uh, but maybe she was i have no idea she she was a very very important person in in the history of winemaking uh, but you can see some of the the story here um uh, i'm gonna talk john that the uh the case that i uh received um has a little bit more bottle age on it this is probably the notes for the release that's coming out of the winery today at this moment yeah we've got, this we've got wines that say uh 17. 17. Yeah. yeah yeah so 17. a little bit more more bottle age and that's another thing that these new dates will help us uh, identify is which cuvee are we talking about um you know some some champagne houses will make a make four or five cuvees a year to keep up with supply they'll even start to number them uh, uh 
you know even brands like Krug are starting to not just be Krug anymore they're gonna they're gonna tell you which number they are um, and 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 it also helps with reviews you know if you re get a review like 92 points it's on this particular vintage uh, or or cuvee um, but uh, the thing I, th I thought was interesting is that 17 percent of this wine is from that perpetual reserve that John was talking about before that started in 1998. So every year they take a little out and they put a little bit in and the uh, average age continues to get a little older and uh, and the, with that depth you're going to continue to get more more cr creativity and, and interesting developments and I think that's a, a, where a lot of this color is also coming from. Yeah. And a little bit of neutral French oak. Yeah, can I ask a, a, of the of the group? Did anybody have a preference of the the two styles? I mean, it's not entirely fair because the the they're from different places, and uh, you know the the um, amount of you know the assemblage is different. They're completely different wines, but just just in terms of style, does anybody have a preference for the style? Terry, do you guys did you guys open both? Yeah, we did. Um, we prefer the first one. Um, like you were saying, and you hit it right on the nose in describing the second one. Um, you get that golden color. It's a little bit more complex. Um, like I said, you described it perfectly of what we were trying to figure out what it was and what you smell. And um, we like the we like the first one a little bit better. Cool. Yeah, and I think that the first one is um, there's a there's a little bit of a safety. Uh, zone in the first one. I mean, it is exactly kind of what you expect, and this one kind of throws you. You're like, "Oh, is this dessert? Oh, why is it so gold? And why is this so perfumed as well? It's just got some pretty exotic character." Yeah, but, um, you hit the gingerbread right on the nose because my first, my very first sip was, "What's that spice?" And then you kind of get that, and then the second sip was a little bit more milder. And as it sat in the glass and wasn't as cold, I, I enjoyed it a little bit more. Uh, hmm. Interesting. For that reason. So I, I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah, I'm, I, I carry both these wines, so I'm a little uh, uh, torn. I think there's, uh, you know, there's a, a kind of a time where you want to open something a little geeky and interesting. And I think this second one will be more for that type of an audience. And then uh, there's going to be days where I want to open something that will have a little broader appeal and I think the first one will will do that for us and I, I do love the Debo's uh, the, the style that they they, they support and um, that, that really nice dry clean um, terroir driven style and I, I think this one is a little bit less about the terroir uh, I mean, it's what terroir is obviously there, but there's so many winemaking decisions in this particular, this next one. And, uh, you know, even the, the preponderance of, uh, of Mounier, that's just something different. So, um, but I do love it. And I think that's, you know, why I love wine so much is just, there's just so many different ways to go and, and there's no one way that's right. And, you know, as long as you can sell your wine, you're in good shape. Yeah, and that was going to be my question that you asked earlier was um, because because you use older vintages to top it off, is that really because of the color you're getting? Um, it, just adding to that uh, color tone or is that it yeah, that would that would do that. And also the the, the small amount of uh, uh, oak aging as well is going to contribute to that. So all those things contribute to it, um, the, the color. Um, and even like I said, the, the natural fermentation, too, because you're not going to take it down too cold because you want the inoculation to hap happen naturally. So you need to allow for, you know, things to move around and a little warmth and and uh, and it's quite honestly a, a pretty risky move to try to go for natural fermentation. Yeah, it is risky because it, it almost tastes like a, an aged champagne. Mm -hmm. in some respects um, because the, the, the effervescence isn't as prevalent. That, that is absolutely a result of the, that reserve as well being 
Yeah, and and it's it's it again. It adds a different kind of complexity, like like Ian said, uh, and uh, and I think that's kind of a cool thing. So, and like Ian said, there are different strokes for. And there's a reason we import both of these wines. They're very they're they're different, and that and and actually, it's a great pairing when we were talking about which wines to to feature. Um, it was it, it it seemed like a good contrast. So um, yeah, and you know, if if, if, if everything stuff. tasted the same, the world would be a boring place. You know. Right. Exactly. So we enjoy the introduction of something different, and uh, so thank you. Cool. Thank you. Good Thanks for trying it. This. Yeah. Uh, Mary, did you enjoy this uh, De Hors? Did, am I pronouncing that, John? I would just De Yeah. Dior. You don't have to say the S on the end. Yeah. You know, you're talking to me? Yeah. Did you like it? I, you know, when I first tasted it, I was like, oh, <laughs> I don't know about this. But then it kind of grows on you. And I actually started to enjoy it. And I really, I really like it. It's, it's not the normal champagne. It's, mm -hmm. it's just different. I can't put a finger on it. It you is, know? it is different for sure. And uh, uh, it, it definitely you have to go out on a limb a little bit. You have to kind of leave the safety net to kind of mm -hmm. go and, and embrace this wine. But, uh, but I, uh, I'm 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 really enjoying it. Um, I definitely will also take that into consideration too when I'm talking to customers. You know, are you are you interested in trying something that'll you know take you on a little bit of a journey? I I, I think this hat offers up some really cool and different pairing opportunities too. I think this um, door is going to be amazing with uh, like. The, Thanksgiving turkey, you know, uh, to really push into that that uh, gamey bird, and especially if you're going to use some great herbs in the preparation and the stuffing. I'm starting to salivate just think about it because it's coming around the corner, um, and we just hit the coldest day of the year, pro probably the most beautiful day of the year. Here, I, I don't know. What did you think, Terry? Was it the most beautiful day of the year? Was it nice in Santa Monica, Mary? Let me get my, 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 yeah, my I, I can hear you. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm off mute. Okay. Um, was it all, was it all for, uh, overcast? Did you have gloom over there? No, 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 it wasn't, it wasn't gloomy. It was sunny, but, um, it was a little on the chilly side, you know, compared to where it's been. You're a beach uh, girl, aren't you? I love it. My Welsh blood was smiling today. This uh, nice, cool breeze and not not windy, and the sky was so beautiful. Um, I, I heard the air quality sucked, but the it was so beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it was a nice day, and you know what? And I have to tell you guys, I went to the Academy Museum last night. Oh my gosh, you guys have to do it. Oh, cool. Where is that? So amazing, the new Academy Museum. It's oh, been in Wilshire. Yeah, on Wilshire on Wilshire and Fairfax. It's been open for about a uh, a week, mm. a week and a half, and I did the tour. It is so worth it, and just go and allow your full two hours. I didn't have the full two hours to go five floors, but it's incredible. It's awesome. incredible what they did. I don't even know why I don't. I don't work for them. I'm not getting commission on this. <laughs> well, nice. I uh, that's cool. I will definitely check into it. Do a wine tasting there. Well, yeah, it's across we from um, across from the Peterson, right? Peterson, across right. From, you, yeah. you could either park at the Peterson or park at the uh, LACMA. I mean, I I've learned so much. It's I'm a member. I'm a member of the Academy Museum. So, Mary, we did we did talk to SoFi, just so you know that, that okay. did happen, and we'll we'll see where that goes. That's Are you going to do it? Well, we'll see where it goes. They have to let me, you know, I can't just show up. <laughs> but we're having that conversation, Mary, because you came up with the idea we should do a, a tasting at SoFi. I'll look in this museum too and see, because we, we definitely need some venues. Yeah, uh, this is going to be an amazing one, Ian. I mean, you could do, I don't know if you, I don't know how you would do it, but there's five floors. 
You yeah. could actually you could do it on the top floor where the Dolby Theater is with a 360 degree view of um, the city of LA. I'm sure they built it that way just so they could have some private events up there. Uh, yeah. the, the number might be a little out of reach, Mary, but we we could talk to them and see. Okay. Uh, I loved working with Peterson too, but that that's a that that number has six digits. So you have to do a really big, big event to be able to make that uh, jam. Uh, when we did the suckling event, it wasn't quite that expensive yet, but it, it has now become there. Well, I don't even know if they're even open right now, but uh, they're probably trying. And all the places are still trying to get open, um, trying to hire, trying to staff. So we'll, we'll keep our Zoom activities going uh, through the end of the year at least. We've got uh, some upcoming tastings that are coming down the pipe. Um, our STARS events are doing really well, guys. Um, this next STARS event, I, this will be the first time we've ever done it this way. It's, it's just going to be really special. Um, we've got uh, the STARS of <clears throat> Argentina, Chile, and California. And I'll just tell you right now that my mouse just died, so I can't show you anything. But uh, uh, we'll just keep it right here. <laughs> um, we've got uh, Stars of Merlot coming at the end of the month. We've got a wine dinner with champagne um, at a Marino. Well, this Sunday, actually, we're doing a dinner in Pasadena at Alexander Steakhouse with incredible collectible California Cabernet. Um, some really just beautifully aged wonderfully uh, uh, 100 point wines just super collectible stuff um, I only have two spots left for the dinner but uh, it's it's gonna be a, a, an amazing event for those that are there Alexander's is a really special spot if you haven't been there before and uh, so I'm starting to put produce some outside events I'm doing my first large uh, format charity tasting this weekend, I am producing uh, the wine element for Mike, Michael Milken's Gourmet Games, which is one of our most uh, uh, treasured events of the year. Um, uh, Mr. Milken raises millions of dollars in one day for cancer research, and all we do is pour wine for the event. It's, we have a very small slice of the pie, but it's just a beautiful, beautiful event, and it's so cool when you see Barbara Streisand or some of the, the top celebrities bidding on stuff or or raising their hand to donate millions of dollars to charity. It's just really uh, incredible to be there. So things are starting to happen. I'm, I'm really happy to see that. I see the health of the city getting better. I see the restaurants getting stronger. And uh, as we move into this fourth quarter, we've got some beautiful stuff to accompany that. John, I want to thank you for being here tonight and for talking thank you. so eloquently about uh, these beautiful wines. Um, I love carrying these. Uh, you, guys, if you if you want to have champagne through the end of the year, we, we do. Um, I have been really putting a lot of our investment into the champagne category, suspecting that November and December will be kind of a bloodbath if you want to be able to find champagne. I hope I have it. I mean, it, it's really going to get tough. But we um, uh, we have more champagne right now than I've ever owned in my life. And so that's a good spot to be in. Uh, and uh, some really interesting stuff. So from all over the place, very proud of the selection that we've put together. Really, really nice uh, set. You know, I only carry one produce, one wine from each producer, and really spread it around. Some, some really awesome stuff. So, check out Merchant of Wine for our champagne selection. Check out the uh, Wine Cloud Inc. for all of our different classes and tastings. And uh, we hope to see you at our upcoming Zooms. Um, I'm hoping that uh, you all join us again soon. Terry, I know I'll see you for stars. So thank you for that. Satsuko, thanks for joining us from Japan. Lisa, always great to see you. Lisa and I are going to be going to Italy. Um, our, our Piedmont trip is coming very, very soon. It's going to be amazing. And uh, we are working on our trip for France. We're going to be looking at going to Provence and to the Rhone. 
Uh, sometime in either March or April. The trip is being pulled together right now. We'll be announcing it in the month of November. So uh, we're working on that right now. And maybe you can join us as we try to go to France in early 2022. Till, uh, see you thank again. you so much. Yeah, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks so much. Uh, it was Welcome. wonderful to talk with you and uh, just exchange some comments on, on great champagne. So I really appreciate cool. uh, you showing me these, these beauties, buddy. We'll do some more business. Excellent. Thank you so thank much. You. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.